Okay. <coughs> okay. Super. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And the rest are pretty straightforward. Yeah. Pretty straightforward. Oh, yeah. Okay. One, three, and four on Trust and Obey. One, three, and four on both of them. Yep. And One, three, and four on both. Have thine own way is all of them. Makes it easy. Yep. Easy peasy. Oh, yeah. It says here all verses on Oh. I'm going to leave that there for me. Yeah. Okay. All right. Would it? Yeah. Okay. Right. You want that? Perfect. No, that's fine. You can until, leave it right there. Right. And I talk to the big female. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Diana. I was not
Good morning. God bless you. Welcome home. Happy to see everyone. Um, we are having life group today. Pastor Buzz will be in Fellowship Hall after service, so that will continue through the summer. Some life groups have taken a break, but not Pastor Buzz. <laughs> um, and today he will be leading us through on the book of Proverbs that we've been going through for the summer. Um, men, the men will be holding a men's study on the second Saturday of each month going forward. Um, so they'll meet in Fellowship Hall this Saturday from 9 to 11. There will be a light breakfast. And if you have any questions about that, you can reach out to um, either Mark or Mickey. Um, the week after, the Saturday after, which is the third Saturday of the month, us women will be getting together again for our women's coffee chat. Um, August 13th, next, sat next Sunday, sorry, um, is when our annual meeting is. So whoever is a member here should have received your letters by now, um, inviting you to be a part as it's our privilege and responsibility to be at the annual meeting. Um, it will be following service after our church service on Sunday. So please bring your own food to eat as you know, our bellies will be growling after church. <laughs> um, we will not be providing food, so just whatever you want to bring to eat is completely fine. Um, Wednesday evening jam is up and running, and praise the Lord for bringing new faces in. It's been a great opportunity to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Um, so they are still serving meals at 5 p.m., um, and then from there we have our corporate prayer, which is hybrid. You can come here in person or reach out for the Zoom link at, um, that's at 6.30. Um, and let us know if you need the link for that. That is following the five o'clock meal. Uh, we are still holding this capital campaign that we've, um, we have a, a poster right here, shows where we're at with that. As you're well aware by now, we have many needs for this building. Um, so I just ask uh, that you would pray to the Lord and see if, if that's something that he's put on your heart to give to. Um, the roof is one of many urgent needs of this church. So if you feel so led, then there are envelopes that say renew on them. That's the capital campaign. You can throw that in the offering, as well as our Tithely app and Bible apps, other ways of um, giving and hearing the sermon. Um, I also wanted to add that this summer for our I guess it's kind of like a VBS, but it's a five-day club. So it's for kids to come August 25th through the 20, I'm sorry, August 21st through the 25th from 10 to 12. It'll be um, music, songs, some, some fun things, uh, a way to share the gospel to other kids in the community, the neighborhood. So if you have friends or know of any um, children, I think it's, I'd have to get back to you on the ages, so reach out to me and ask exactly what ages. I think it's um, probably first through fifth grade, but I, I really, don't hold me to that. <laughs> um, so that's 10 to 12, and that'll be at the end of August. Um, now, if the TVs are working, we would love to transition to, with a video. It's just noise. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's meaningless. It's meaningless. 
But what God has to say to us through His word, through His word, prayer, through, through prayer, His people, through His that's people. Different. That's different. That's what matters. That's what matters. His presence. His presence. It's rest for our it's weary souls. It's weary souls. It's peace for it's our worried minds. It's peace minds. It's hope for our it's troubled hearts. For our troubled hearts. We don't have to earn we his don't attention. Have to earn his attention. We don't have to work for we don't his love. Work for his love. It's already it's ours. It's already ours. It is freely given. It is freely given. He's waiting for us. He's to be waiting for us to be with him. There is nothing more. There is nothing more important. Nothing matters more. Nothing matters more than being present. Than being present with God. With God. Amen. Now please stand for the call to worship and join me in saying Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now I will read through Psalm 8, and then we will um, get into our singing of hymns, which we're going to be starting, hymn number 29. If you'd like to follow along on your hymnal books, it should also be on the screens for you. How majestic is his name, truly. O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds, the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now number 29, glorify thy name. Thank you. 
for the offertory, if we could have the ushers line up in the back, we will be singing from hymn number 349, Trust and Obey. But we are actually doing verses 1, 3, and 4 of this song. Father, we do thank you for these gifts. We know they're only a portion of what really we owe to you. We just pray, Lord, that it may be used to glorify your name, glorify this church in the town and in the area. And Lord, again, we just pray and thank you for this day and the opportunity that we have to be here and to worship you. We pray these offerings are acceptable to you. This we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mickey. Now Anra will be coming up and sharing the scripture reading. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. God is good and all the time. Y Dios es bueno y todo el tiempo. Ah, okay, it's coming from up there too. Okay, good. Good, good job, good job. So, today's verse is Proverbs 6, 12 through 19. And it goes like this. A troublemaker and a villain who, gives, who goes about with a corrupt mouth, who winks maliciously with his eye, signals with his feet, and motions with his fingers, who plots evil with deceit in his heart. He always stirs up conflict. Therefore, disaster will overtake him in an instant. He will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush to, into evil, a false witness who pours out lies and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. 
Versículo para hoy es Proverbios 6, 12 al 19. El bribón y ser vergüenza, el vagabundo de boca corrupta, hace guiño, guiños con los ojos y señas con los pies y con los dedos. El malvado trama el mal en su mente y siempre anda provocando disensiones. Por eso lo se provenderá la ruina. De repente será destruido y no podrá evitarlo. Hay seis cosas que el Señor oberrece y siete que le son detestables. Los ojos que se enaltecen, la lengua que miente, las manos que derraman sangre inocente, el corazón que hace planes perversos, los, los pies que corren a los malos y el falso testigo que es, esparce men, mentiras y el que siembra desor, discordia entre hermanos. Amén. No, it's not. Yes, it is. I was going to say either that or there. there's a really bad echo off the back wall there. But All right. Very good. Now, let me get this out of the way. Obviously, you're aware that Anwar just read to us from the Proverbs, and I'm going to say a little bit about that, but I've got to tell you, when I was planning this message, I was almost tempted, and the operative word here is almost, I was almost tempted to use the King James Version. <laughs> you, you, now, for those of you who know me, that's, that's really unusual, but I couldn't help but say, Six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to, unto him. It just flows like oil, doesn't it? Just, yea, seven. That stuff preaches good. But I'm going to go back to my legacy standard Bible, which doesn't preach as good, okay? But, but it's the same message. Obviously, the King James is, is unsurpassed when it comes to poetry. And that's what we're looking at, by the way. Uh, because the Proverbs, the Psalms, those are poetic books. It's written in poetic form. And if you have a modern translation of the scriptures that shows this, uh, like my Bible, it has it in stanza form, where you have one line, then the next line, like you would read music and poems today. Well, that's important in Hebrew poetry. In fact, I'm going to give you something you can use a long time into the future now about interpreting Hebrew poetry. Because it is written in stanza form, and it is poetry, uh, oft times, when you're interpreting it, the way it's written, they, don't, they didn't rhyme things like, you know, a birdie with a yellow bill hopped upon my windowsill, cocked his shiny eye and said, ain't you ashamed, you sleepyhead? That was Robert Louis Stevenson. How do you like that? I actually memorized the poem. <sighs> my teachers would be proud of me. But we rhyme words at the ends of of sentences when we're writing poetry today. But the Hebrews did not rhyme words, they rhymed thoughts. So what you have quite often is one line will make a statement and the very next line will say that statement in different words. Sometimes if you look at a word and you say, what does that mean? Read the next line, ah, oh, that's it, okay, now I get it. Or it might 
embellish the first line by saying the exact opposite of what the first line said. So we have things like an example. He hit him on the head, yea, he smote him on the bean. That's Hebrew poetry, okay? I, that, wasn't that wasn't from the Proverbs or the Psalms, just so you know. But you get the idea. It helps to interpret unclear things in light of what is clear. But sometimes whole passages do the same thing, and that's what we have today. We have two paragraphs that are rather par uh, parallel if you look at them. I should also mention that Proverbs is truisms. What do I mean by that? It's poetry. It's written in such a way to make you think. But it is poetry. So it's not the kind of passages like you would get in the Gospels where you take every word apart and look at the meanings of each word and come up with all kinds of interesting things. Pretty much, and this is what's very difficult, I, I feel sorry for the other pastors as well, because when, you, when you're preaching from a, a series from the Proverbs and you read the proverb, you pretty much said it by reading it. It causes you to think. It's not something where, now this word comes from the original Hebrew, blah, 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 and you go through and you know, exegete it and get a whole different meaning out of it. No, it's just stuff that you read as a, hmm, hmm. It makes you think. And with that thinking comes wisdom. Now, it's kind of like sermons, which sermons are like meals. And I've said this before, I think in the uh, life group I said this once or twice, or many, many, many more times, that it's, it's like a meal. Uh, you might not remember every meal your wife cooked you, but you're better off because you had them. It's the way it is with poetic literature, especially in the Bible. You may not <coughs> get all kinds of earth-shattering stuff from it, but you're better off for having done it because you're thinking through these things. And thinking brings wisdom. You, if you read through the Proverbs, you will be a wiser person whether you actually grasp everything that's there or not, which is the way I tell people that are, especially new converts, about the whole scripture. Just read it. <laughs> Get used to what it says because there's a lot of people who stand behind pulpits even who don't really know what it says. They, they know what they were told it said, but they don't know what it really says. Get familiar with the scriptures. Well, that's kind of the way it is here. And we have two texts here, two paragraphs, 12 through 15, and then 16 through 19. And of course, I'm going to uh, go primarily through 16 through 19 this morning, because that's telling us the things God hates. The differences are this, though. One passage that reads very similar, 12 through 15, shows the end of the wicked. You know, these, these are the wicked people. Here's the things they do. They, they wink with their eyes. You know what that means. You know, I, you, you get the clue. You've seen this in the movies. You understand when somebody winks, a lot of times it's not a good thing. It's subliminal messages to somebody else, like, don't tell them, huh? okay? You know? All these things that they do in that first paragraph, but it says their end will come. How does it, how does it say here? And um, instantly he will be broken and there will be no healing. Or the first line of that says in verse 15, therefore his disaster will come suddenly. He's talking about the end of, of their, that kind of lifestyle. <clears throat> now, there wasn't too much emphasis in the Old Testament put on going to hell when you die, although they were aware of the concept. But any way you look at it, it's worded in such a way that this is not intended to be a pretty sight the sudden calamity that comes upon them. And this is a very typical thing in, in, the, New, in the Old Testament. I mean, David had this problem. You know, Lord, why, why do you allow these wicked people to prosper like they do? I thought it should have been the other way around. I mean, you watch the TV preachers today. If you come to Christ, you're supposed to be the head, not the tail. You're going to be, you know, the rich people. And then you see a lot of Christians who aren't rich, and you say, what happened? How, co how come it's not true? How, you know, that, that's very discouraging. But we have a forward look to what's going to happen ultimately. And though it may look at this point like we are the tail sometimes, 
with notable exceptions, their end is going to come suddenly, and there will be no healing after that. No more chance of redemption. So it's a scary thought that those who pride themselves in their private handshakes and winks and all these things are going to come to an end, and it's going to be bad. But then verses 6 through 19 shows God's moral judgment on these things, where he's saying, I hate these things. Now, <clears throat> we're not accustomed to hearing the word God and hate in the same sentence, but it, it, it happens. There are six things which Yahweh hates, even seven which are an abomination to him. What is an abomination? Well, I didn't happen to notice this, but the NIV that was read this morning stole some of my thunder. It's what God finds detestable, things that are detestable. Extreme disgust and hatred, you can imagine. Loathing. Now, that didn't sink in enough, I'm sure. So what I want you to do is think of something that you absolutely hate. I don't care if it's spiders or peanut butter. I oh, can't even say. Yeah, something you really loathe that's just terrible. You can't stand even being in its presence. Then you get the picture of what's going on here. There are certain things that God loathes. He hates. It's detestable to him. And by the way, this is not an exhaustive list. If you get out a good, good old Strong's concordance, that's from the King James Version, but any exhaustive concordance to any version, they have them for the NIV and the New American Standard, if you look up abomination and detestable, you'll get a, a whole bunch of things that God hates. It may surprise you, some of those things. But we need to know what God finds detestable because I don't want to be involved with anything that God hates. Now, the first six things in this all refer, you'll notice, to body parts. I hope you got your Bibles. I, I don't know. The, the, the verses are going to be up there, but um, we're, going, we're looking really hard at this text, okay? <laughs> it refers to body parts. Eyes, tongue, hands, heart, feet, and lungs. How do we handle our bodies? Do we handle them in such a way that God is pleased, or does God find the way we handle our bodies detestable? Remember last week, Pastor Steve was talking about the phylacteries that the Pharisees wore. You, you remember, it, it went something like this. Now you remember? Okay, you know, they wore the law of God on their foreheads. Well, they actually did that in obedience they were taking it very wooden literal, but the law of God is to be written on our foreheads and, by the way, there's references to his law being on our hands because God's law is supposed to dictate the thoughts of our mind and the work of our hands. But the seventh thing here is different. It goes outside of ourselves to the corporate nature of things. The corporate nature. We are part of a community of believers. There's no such thing in the New Testament as a lone Christian. With, you've seen them with the black mask and the hat and all that. A Christian that feels, well, I don't need to go to church. I, I, can, just, uh, I, can, be, I can love God and, and just as much without going to church. Pull that one on Jesus on Judgment Day. I know you said you're going to build your church and I'm to be part of it and I'm to be baptized and under the authority of the elders, but you know, that didn't mean me. I, I loved you without that stuff. No, you didn't. If you can't do the first things that he says to do, I, I have to question your love for him. But because we're part of a community of believers, something's put in here that goes outside of our body parts and talks about our relationship to one another. So let's, without... As long as I'm quoting the King James, I might as well quote Shakespeare too, don't you think? Without any further ado, <laughs> there, I did it. Let's get on to these things that God hates. The first thing is haughty eyes, which is just another... Now, keep in mind, this is poetry, so it's finding these poetic ways of saying simple things. 
Find the simplicity of it. It's another way of saying pride, which was the original sin. I can be like God. Wow, if, if I eat this fruit, I'll be able to determine what's right and wrong. And allegedly, even Satan himself fell for the same lie, that he wanted to be like the most high. But also, pride, I find, is, I, I call it the acceptable sin, because you've heard those conversations before. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm pretty good. I, I try to obey God and everything. I just got this little problem with pride, but other than that, you know, things aren't so bad in my life. Oh, really? <laughs> if that's the problem, yeah, things are pretty bad in your life, because God finds that detestable. And he specifically uses the eyes, haughty eyes. Now, I don't know if I can... Uh, how am I doing? <laughs> Is anybody out there? Ah, here. Uh, I don't think I can do it. But you know it when you see it, don't you? When somebody's haughty, it shows in the countenance on their face. They have that look of arrogance. Well, we have some solutions suggested in the scriptures for us to make sure that we don't have haughty eyes. One that comes to mind is Romans 12, 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to each one among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound thinking. King James soberly had to get that one out too. As God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Now, the problem with this passage here is usually that we think too highly of ourselves than we should. That's very easy to do. You live with yourself, you understand yourself better than anybody else, so you know just how much more wonderful you are than everybody else. That's thinking more highly than we ought to. But... There's another side to that coin. He says to think so is to have sound thinking, sound judgment about ourselves. What on earth does he mean there? Well, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to, but don't think more lowly of yourself either. As it says, God has allotted to each a measure of faith. There are some people that are great examples to us because of their great faith. We, 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 we want to be like the Apostle Paul and so forth. And, and we realize how miserably short we come. But God has also gifted you in certain areas. He's given you a measure of faith. And if you look around you, you will always find greater and lesser than yourself, wherever you are. But why are you there? Well, God put you there. He gave you a particular measure of faith. And this spills out into other things in life. And... Um, how, how do I say this without sounding like I'm guilty of my own preaching here? Uh, but, I mean, okay, I've practiced for over 50 years playing the trumpet. <clears throat> so when I do a concert and somebody comes up to me afterwards and says, oh, wow, you're the greatest thing since Maynard Ferguson, not only do I want to adopt them, <clears throat> I, I, I like... Oh, no, nah, it, was, it, was, it was nothing. Oh, Maynard, he's good, man. I just, oh, nah, nah, nah. No, 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 no. Look, I've learned to say thank you. Why? And this is where it's hard to say it, but facts be known. Because I know I'm good at it, because I earned it. I practiced for 50 years. I ought to be. But why? Because God has given that to me. Not because I am so great. And not like trumpet playing makes a whole lot of difference in life anyway. You can't even make a living on it anymore, hardly. I tried once. And you can be as good as you want, and it's not necessarily going to make you a lot of money. But God has given us a measure of faith, and, and this, this is even brought out better in this passage here. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What do you have that you did not receive? In other words, everything you have, you have received. And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? There is sober thinking. Yes, you have certain abilities, and in certain areas you may excel above your peers. But why is that? Because you received it from God. 
So should you go around boasting like, I'm better at this than you? I know the Bible better than you. Oh, you think you're hot stuff. Well, how do you think you know the Bible better than them? Because God gave it to you. So why are you boasting as if it was some inherent goodness in yourself that brought you to that point? And every time I think I come to that point, somebody shares something with me and then I realize that a lot of what I thought was wrong anyway. Oh, that's humbling, that's humbling I'll tell you what. <laughs> but recognize that God has given certain abilities, he's given certain measures of faith. We should not get cocky over it if it's a good gift from God. The solution is don't try to look humble. Be humble. That's what God wants. Anything else is detestable. Second thing is a lying tongue. And I think this one's longer than the other. It was longer than the others. I don't know. I hope. <laughs> Have you ever noticed how difficult it is to operate in our society because of lying? When you go to the grocery store, you've been lied to. This product, by where it is on the shelf, by the price we charge for it, is better than this product up here that's not as colorful. You've been lied to. I mean, it happens all the time. It's come to be expected that politicians lie. Every election, oh, they all lie. The strange thing is we're okay with it. That's a very strange concept when you think about it, that those who are going to be our policy makers are liars, and we vote them in. Sometimes we don't have a choice. It's which liar is better than the other. I vote for the lesser liar every time. How do I know? Well, then we come to the media lying. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's difficult. But you see my point. It's hard to function because there is a lot of lying that goes on in our society. And unfortunately, a lot of lying goes on in the name of the Lord also. Watch any TV preacher for five minutes and you've probably heard a hundred lies. I'm not kidding. Uh, they lie all the time. Why? Because when they lie, people give. They're told to lie that they're going to be prosperous if they give to their ministry. You're going to have all this wealth. Or God's okay with you when you've never repented of your sin and believed on Christ. Sometimes I wish I haven't, hadn't seen so much, but I can't go back and unsee a lot of it. I've read a lot of books from varying opinions theologically, and what's interesting is to see where some of them you can tell. Famous authors are guilty of lying about their opponents and so forth. Well, Jesus said in John 8, 44, talking to the Jewish leaders of his time, you are of your father the devil. Oh, can you imagine saying that to the Sanhedrin at that time? The, the, the Jewish leaders? You're of your father the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Did you catch that? Let those words sink in. There's no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You got the NIV up there? Um, yeah, the NIV. You notice what it says? He speaks his native language when he lies. And that's the way it is with the unconverted all too often, too. If You know how you know they're lying? Their mouth is moving. They're speaking their native language. Lying is the native language of the ungodly. And God detests a lying tongue. Jesus said it very clearly. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. If you've got to go through all these contortions to convince people, you probably got a pretty bad point. But then the third thing is hands that shed innocent blood. Wow. I, I hardly need to say that there's a low value put on life today. Because... In our schools, we are taught not that we are created in the image of God, but we're taught that we 
absolutely in all ways are not created in the image of God. We came out of some slime pit billions of years, maybe millions, I don't even know. It doesn't matter because it's all wrong anyway. Like they really know either, right? You came from random chance. So if we're here by random chance, then there's no God whose image we're created in, and therefore there's a low opinion of human life. You don't find godly societies murdering six million people because of who they are. You just don't see that. This is why God has prescribed the death penalty for murder, specifically because we are created in the image of God. The first mention we have of it is Genesis 9, 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. You would think there was something wrong with a guy if he hung a picture of his wife up on the wall and then started to throw darts at it, wouldn't you? You say, that's... Something's not normal here. God looks at it that way. When, when a man takes the life of another man, they've thrown a dart at the picture of God. And he's not okay with it. But we are so accustomed to seeing death and murder on TV that it just seems like it's all in a day's work to us now. We've seen it so many times. But it says in Proverbs 8.36, all those who hate me love death. And I'm going to say something right now. I don't know how we could read such a proverb and not apply it to the abortion industry. Because I remember years ago, I'm talking decades now, when I was early in the ministry, I remember hearing the, the rates, the, the the death rates from abortion, and they took something like six or seven of the chief American cities, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, all these big cities. The population of these cities combined equals the number of babies that were aborted before they were ever born. You talk about a low value put on life. They shed the most innocent blood of anybody. More than Hitler, more than Stalin, and they don't carry Uzis and bazookas. They wear smocks and rubber gloves. Murdering takes the most precious thing that a person possesses, and that is his life. And this is why we need to be careful also even about wars. Did you know the Bible talks about just and unjust wars as well? Aggressive people like Hitler must be stopped. Yes, it required a war to do that. But then the questions come up. Should I go off to some foreign land and kill somebody's husband and somebody's father or son so that I can pay lower prices at the gas pump? I submit to you that is an unjust war. And I don't claim to have the answers for every situation. I'm just saying... God detests hands that shed innocent blood in any venue, whether it's war, whether it's murder, whatever. God detests it. And then the fourth thing is a heart that devises wicked thoughts. It says in Genesis 6, 5, Then Yahweh saw that the evil of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. In other words, people are rotten to the core. And don't think that that has ever changed. It's never going to change until the final resurrection. But seeing that that is the condition of man and knowing that that was also my condition, it makes us all the more thankful for God's grace and his mercy. Jesus said in Luke 6.45, the good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. You see, every thought is evil. For his mouth speaks from the abundance of his heart. Listen to a person's speech if you want to know their character. 
What do they like to talk about? And do I need to mention the expletives that, that some people cannot seem to talk without? Because that's the abundance of their heart. They're speaking. Their heart is devising wicked thoughts, and those thoughts come out in their words. That's why one of my favorite ministry texts is 2 Corinthians 10.5, where we tear down speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Anything that drives people away from the truth is wicked. We are told to think God's thoughts after him. And then there's the next thing, feet that hasten to run to evil. That's why the Proverbs tell us in so many places, for example, 426, watch the track of your feet and all your ways will be established. What does it say? Give careful thought to the path for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Same idea. Why? Watch the path of your feet. That's important. Because your feet take you to what you're going to be doing. It's kind of like the phylacteries on your forehead and on your, your hand. Watch the direction of your feet. Which direction are you running? Speaking of running, one of the things the Bible says is to flee immorality. Run away from it. Flee. Get lost. Get, get, far, get a lot of space between you and it f quickly. <coughs> but... You want to have beautiful feet? Uh, my feet are not beautiful. I uh, admit to you that I had a lawnmower accident when I was a sophomore in high school. I ran over my sandaled foot with a power lawnmower. It's not as bad as you're thinking, but I wanted to, I, I wanted to see your faces when I told you that, though. <laughs> I lost eight millimeters of bone and they were able to stretch it and sew it up and all that stuff. But it's not pretty. And then my daughter took me once to have a pedicure done. <laughs> I just seen the look on their face. <laughs> but you want to have beautiful feet? Listen to this, Isaiah 52, 7. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who proclaims good news, who announces peace and proclaims good news of good things, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. Let your feet carry you to good works. When I was, before I went to college, I was involved in a ministry under a, a mentor who uh, was teaching us how to share Christ. And we used to go to shopping plazas all the time. And you know, when it gets really hot, everybody left little cracks in their windows. We would go through these shopping malls with these tracks that my mentor had printed up. And we would slide them in there. And... And, just, and if we saw somebody sitting in their car, we would actually talk to them and share Christ with them. One time, my car was driving by me, and the lady had her window open. I said, here, would you, you know, can I give you this? And she says, this is the fifth mall you've got me at today. <laughs> you better listen, girl. <laughs> God's talking to you. But I remember we would get back. We were walking all day on... Pavement, asphalt, you know, parking lots. And our feet would be hurting like crazy. And I remember our mentor, <laughs> Brother Earl, we called him, smiling and saying, the Bible says you have beautiful feet because we were out sharing the gospel. But God hates feet that hasten to run to evil. So let's use our feet to do good then it's, he hates a false witness who breathes out lies. Now this, is, this sounds redundant in a way because we already saw he hates a lying tongue. Now he hates a false witness who breathes out lies. There's the lungs instead of just, just the mouth. But it goes beyond that because this is involving a um, character assassination, ruining another person's reputation. It implies being in court or perjury. This is what is called in many circles the ad hominem fallacy. If you can't answer the objections, attack the person. Stick it to the man. That's what it means, to the man. And this sounds like politics as usual, if I've ever heard it before. When you can't 
argue against their views, their political views, you just show what a terrible person he is. Does this sound familiar at all, by the way? Uh, I'm not going to say anything political this morning, but uh, yeah, we see this all the time. I just saw a little bit of it this morning, as a matter of fact, on the news. It's interesting the way the, the ninth commandment is worded. Now, you know, people say the ninth commandment is against lying. Then why didn't it say thou shalt not lie? It said, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. It implies witnessing as like in a court. Why didn't it say thou shalt not lie? Any more than it didn't say thou shalt not kill. It said thou shalt not commit murder. There's differences. When people were hiding Jews in the upper rooms and the Nazis came to get them and they lied about it, they were doing God a service. The midwives were honored by God when they lied through their teeth to Pharaoh saying, we can't catch up to these Hebrew women. They're, they're having the kids before we can get there. And they were blessed because of that. Rahab was blessed and even appears in the messianic line because she lied to those who were seeking out the spies when she hid them on the roof. So it didn't say in Exodus 20, 16, you shall not lie. It says you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And this, again, has to do with character assassination. Somebody who, well, I see this a lot. Right at home where I live, I used to go down every morning, not every morning, three times a week, for coffee. And it suddenly dawned on me that everybody at the table talked about anybody that walked by, and I got to thinking about that. Hmm. So when I'm not here drinking coffee and I walk by, I figured it out. Character assassinations. I found out that people aren't anywhere near as bad as what people say of them. <laughs> because there are a lot of false witnesses who breathe out lies, and God finds that detestable. And the last one, one who spreads strife among brothers. This is the one that goes corporate on us. God's plan for the church is always unity. <clears throat> and when I say the word unity, a lot of you already, it's in your brain, so I'm going to take you there. Psalm 133. Right? That's what you were thinking. Say yes. Thank you. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. We always stop there because that's the neat part of it. Now it's going to get messy. Listen to this. It is like good oil upon the head. Bad hair day coming up. Coming down upon the beard. Aaron's beard. What? Unity's like oil coming on Aaron's beard. Coming down upon the edges of his robes. Oh, come on now. This is going too far. This is really getting sloppy now. What is that all about? And then it says it's like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there Yahweh commanded the blessing, life forever. Well, the reason it's beautiful is because the oil running over Aaron's head onto his beard and all down his clothes was when he was being anointed for the priesthood, which is a picture of redemption. You know, that thing we get when we come to Christ. <laughs> it's a picture of that. And he's saying, that's beautiful. And God wants his people to dwell together in unity. What's interesting is, in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, and I could preach six messages on this because I did once. So I know it's possible. It's possible. For me. I could probably do more than that, but I won't do that. Um, it says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are, now listen to these things, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife. That's the one we're talking about. Just showing it in the context. Jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envyings, drunkenness, carousings, and in case anything was left out, it says, and things like these, of which I, this is scary, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
right in the middle of that is strife. And in my six parts on the deeds of the flesh and fruit of the Spirit, I told what each one of these was. Strife is the outward expression of the inward hate that we have towards a person. So when somebody's home is ripped by strife, it starts in the heart. Somebody hates somebody and wants them to know it. So everything that comes out of their mouth is strife. And yet, it says those who practice, if that's your lifestyle, it says you shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. I mean, the kingdom of God. That, that's, that's pretty serious. Because God's plan for his people is unity. In fact, uh, my point here is called smoking a tradition. Okay? So guess what I'm going to talk about now? 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Do you not know that you are a sanctuary of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man destroys the sanctuary of God, God will destroy him, for the sanctuary of God is holy, and that is what you are. I don't know if I've ever heard anybody read this verse, these two verses, out of the context of smoking cigarettes. What? Yeah. Oh, you need to stop doing that because... God's going to destroy you for doing that because you're destroying, your body's the temple of the Holy Spirit and you're destroying the temple and God's going to get you for that. Guess what? God doesn't have to destroy you for smoking cigarettes because the cigarettes can do them, can do it all by themselves. They don't need God's help, believe me. But why? Now, I checked this out and, and, and please, not right now, you're listening to me, but later, uh, check this out. Look at the context of those two verses. Paul is talking about the unity of the body. Then for two verses, he tells people don't smoke. And then the rest of the chapter, he's talking about the unity of the body. Huh? What, what, what did he do that for? He didn't change the subject. Um, man, this is my day for quoting the King James. Ye are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's plural when it says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not talking about you yourself. It's talking about you, all of you, are the temple. As you sit here this morning, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And if you destroy the unity of that temple, God will destroy you because his program is unity. And he detests people who cause strife among brethren. So, I'm glad we get along pretty good in this church, aren't you? <laughs> So he's warning about breaking up the unity, not smoking, because his plan is always unity. Do not sow strife among the brethren. What if you got something against them? Go to them and talk to them about it. If there's a real problem, bring it two or three witnesses. You know, go through due process that the scriptures give you, but don't just go spreading strife among the brethren, because that divides, and God's against that. So basically... We have here defined unconverted people. The things that they do, God detests. But they are slaves to sin. They have to sin. Telling them not to, you're wasting your words. They need the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to know of God's mercy and grace so that they will no longer be slaves to sin because otherwise they're going to continue being guilty of all these things that God hates. But after we come to Christ, instead of all our works being filthy rags and all, we actually earn rewards then for our good works. We weren't lovable when he saved us, but because he saved us, we are lovable. In fact, he's commanded us to love one another. So, all I'm saying is this. All I'm saying after all this time? <laughs> if we truly love God we will not want to be involved in anything that God hates. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the warnings that come from your scriptures. And thank you, Lord, especially for changing us because, yeah, we've just described ourselves before Christ. And all too often, sometimes even since then. But help us to be mindful of these things. And may we be more conformed to the image of your Son because we were here reading these words of wisdom, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. We will be turning to hymn number 371 now, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. They know I'm technically challenged. You may sit down. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this message today. There are many things, Lord, that we know that you do not enjoy us doing. We find ourselves doing them sometimes without even thinking, and yet we, we begin our day talking to you and speaking to you and reading your word, we might be better prepared, Lord, to do those things that would glorify you. If we have something against our neighbor, as pastor said, we should go to him. And if we need to bring others with us in trying to rectify that which is wrong, we pray, Lord, that you would give us that wisdom. Lord, we pray for our week coming up we pray that we might glorify you. We know we have those who are not able to attend because of either physical issues or just not able to get here because of either living somewhere where they're not around a vehicle. We just pray that we would glorify them, Lord, by our prayers. We again pray to be with the pastor as he's still on vacation after being away. Pray for our meeting next Sunday, Lord. Our business meeting may be used to glorify you. Again, we thank you for the message this morning. Knowing, Lord, that there are times when we feel we want to be, be lifted up by another friend or a, a loved one, just someone, Lord, who just comes along and just helps us, Lord, know that you are the way, Lord, to glorify our, our life. We just pray, Lord, that we would give you our life in, in what we do, in what we say, we speak, and the way we act. We thank you, Lord, for just this morning. In thy son's precious name, amen. Okay, now please join us in hymn number four, How Great Thou Art. We will be doing verses one, three, and four. Throughout the 
Receive the Lord's benediction from 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, 24, and 28. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.